So hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I have a lot of energy, and I'm very expressive. Um, I just want to be sure you saw that before the end of the day. So that's covered. Um, what I want to do is share with you a body of research that I'm involved with that I think um, gives us great hope for creating a transformation of culture globally and an evolution of all of our governing uh, and commerce systems in a period of only a few decades. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> um, so the brief version of what I do is um, I study complex systems and I study the evolution of culture. So I study how dynamic patterns arise in cultural systems, how they lead to the creation of institutional forms, and how the feedbacks between institutional forms, uh, standard cultural narratives of various flavors, common practices that people have, and the underlying human component of our brains, our bodies, our evolutionary history, our cognitive systems, how all of those feed back on each other to generate the dynamics of culture. And um, recently, I had the great pleasure of joining forces with a Hungarian fellow by the name of Laszlo Karafiath, who has been studying memetics for about 10 years now. And memetics is the study of memes. For those of you who don't know what a meme is, I'd like to thank my illustrious friend Bruce Herbert for giving me a good example. One of the most powerful memes of the modern era. The Blue Marble, a photograph taken in 1972, a photograph that, when released by NASA to the general public, launched the modern environmental movement. For the first time in our history, we had a concept that we could feel, that could give our emotions a place to go, that showed us we are in one home and we're all connected. And as much despair as there's been this morning, you have no freaking idea how far we've come since 1972. Holy shit. It's worthy of cursing about. I'd drop the F-bomb if I just felt a little more. <clears throat> so my, my colleague Lazo and I have done some really cool research. Um, we use crowdfunding because people don't normally pay for things that they don't understand. And we raised $20,000 using crowdfunding to study the global warming meme. In order to do that, we had to get into the minds of thousands of people to see how they think and talk about it. This was the opposite of what public opinion research does. Public opinion research presumes a concept, throws it at the audience, and then has them respond to it to see how they feel about it. How concerned are you about global warming? How do you feel about gun control? That's how normal opinion research is done. What we did was we looked at the generative, creative expressions of human beings with all of their grammatical errors, with all of their untruths, misconceptions, false understandings. And then we did a complex statistical analysis of those to see how they all relate to each other, and we created an ecological map. And this ecological map tells us, just like with the web of life, how there's a wolf, and the wolf will eat the bunny. But that's okay, because there's the bear, and the bear will eat the wolf. So we can see the relationships between these different memes. We broke them into five categories. There are the defining memes that tell us what this thing is we're talking about. These are the cultural expressions that people have that tell them what is global warming. And then there are immune deficiency memes. These are the part of global warming that tell us it's inherently weak. An example. When I think about a world with global warming, I feel traumatized and, para and paralyzed. When someone says that, they are expressing part of the emotional baggage of global warming that makes it a meme that does not like to spread. Then there are hostile memes. Hostile memes are those memes that live out in the world that are threatened by our meme. They're the ones that will only spread if our meme is actively destroyed. Think of economic growth and all of its related memes how hostile it is toward global warming. Then there are parasitic memes. Now remember, the food of memes is human attention. So to be a parasite means that they eat up the attention that your meme would otherwise be consuming to nourish itself. So these are the memes that aren't about what you're talking about. They're not about global warming. But there are things like, well, I've got to be a nuclear activist this Saturday, but I also need to buy a couch. What are those other memes? that are taking our attention away from this one. And then, 
there are the most important kind of memes. Symbiotic. They're the ones that aren't about global warming, but they spread just fine and dandy on, your, on their own, thank you very much. And if global warming plays nicely with them, they can swim together in the wide blue ocean where there are no predators, where there are no parasites, and they can discover new colonies. So when we did our research on the global warming meme, we learned what should surprise no one in this room, that global warming is a really lousy meme. It does a terrible job of spreading. It is really hard to get people to think about it and act on it. It's really hard to get people to feel compelled on their own to tell stories about it or to bring it up at cocktail parties. By the way, side note, come to any cocktail party at my house. We're talking like this all the damn time. You're welcome to come on over. Um, <laughs> and we have good beer because it's Seattle. <clears throat> so basically, um, we learned that global warming is a terrible meme and that at best, it has infested and infected the minds of perhaps 5% of the global population. It's 350 million people. I think that's a high bar. Having the global, me global warming meme infect you does not mean you've heard of it. It means that it generates your action, that it drives your behavior. That's a, there's a small number of people in the world who have the meme in that way. And when we looked at what the meme is composed of, what its ecosystem looks like, we understood why. So in our research, we're able to bundle the meme that we're studying into different uh, conceptual categories that explain a lot of the core tension in the discourse. For global warming, we found five. The first one we called harmony. Harmony is fundamentally about whether human beings are in harmo harmonious relationship with the planet or not. So you can imagine lots of examples that someone might say that we are in harmony with the planet, that we're not in harmony with the planet, that humans are special spiritual beings that are gonna leave this wreck anyway, please bring on the apocalypse. You can imagine all sorts of scenarios where people are playing out this core tension of harmony or disharmony with the planet. See how that generates lots of tension, lots of feeling, lots of dialogue, lots of action. The second one we discovered, we called survival. And this is the one that told us the most about why global warming doesn't spread. The survival category went from two poles. Extinction of the entire human species, or we barely scrape by and live in a Mad Max future. <clears throat> not very enticing. That meme is not gonna spread worth a damn. It's a terrible story. Good luck selling it. Coca-Cola sure as hell isn't gonna present that to get people to buy sugar water. And so that's what we've got right now. Now the third one that we found was cooperation which is basically feelings about whether human beings can come together as a global species and work on our better behalf, or whether we're too divided and fragmented to do so. And there were lots of different feelings and expressions about that. The fourth one we called momentum. Momentum is about whether we feel like we're making forward progress or whether we feel like we're stagnating. And there were lots of different feelings about that, and sometimes people thought it was good because the status quo is pretty awesome, thank you very much. You know the people that think that way? but this was a core tension that is unresolved. The fifth one we called elitism. And elitism, ironically, was not about elite versus the populace. It was about my elite versus your elite. If I'm a global warming advocate, I think those scientists are awesome, and I think your politicians suck. If I'm a fundamentalist Christian who thinks that your science is invalidating my core beliefs and my Bible, then your scientists can kiss my ass. So we found what the elitism dimension was that both sides were cynical, both of them were disrespectful, there were a lot of rude comments going both ways by a lot of people, and there was very little of what Richard had called for, which was thoughtful, deliberative dialogue. So this is the global warming meme. This is what it is in the minds of thousands of people that we studied. And it tells us why that global warming meme is not actively generating behavior for 70% of the population. So what I'd like to do now in our conversation is talk about what we can do about this. And I have a lot of ideas of my own, but uh, like Anna, I don't have a full day workshop. And so what I'd love to do is have some conversation with you in the next few minutes about what this stirs in you, how it causes you to respond, and what we can do about it.
You mentioned symbiotic means, memes, um, uh, but unless I wasn't paying attention, you didn't tell us what they were. <laughs> no, I didn't. The symbiotic memes are those memes that are spreading very well on their own. One of the, the next projects we're going to do is we're going to study the memes for the sharing economy. Because this sharing economy that is hacking the culture of ownership, that is changing the way that we relate to property, is getting expressed in every possible domain of commerce right now. It is growing and exploding like crazy. Uh, we saw it with Napster followed by iTunes, followed by people being pissed off that Apple is trying to control who I can share my stuff with. So there's this dynamic tension in the evolution of how we feel about collaboration and sharing. So we want to do a, a deep dive into it to see what that meme landscape looks like so that we can start linking global warming to it because it's part of the pathway to uh, hacking the core paradigm of our economy. Other questions, comments? Richard, over here. So <clears throat> I've always felt really ambivalent about the words global warming or climate change, because neither of them are really easy to talk to people about. And so is there, is it conceivable to imagine a whole new set of words, a set of images that could be used that could replace both of those terms, which each have their own, some, they, they, they have some strengths, but they have so many weaknesses and so many of the issues that you're talking about. Um, there better be or screwed. Um, and luckily, there are. I mean, think about a recent viral phenomenon, Gangnam Style, which you probably have all heard of, whether you like it or not. This very unusual uh, song and dance form that came out of Korea recently. Gangnam Style is awesome at spreading because it invites people to be playful. It um, draws upon a spoof, making fun of the wealthy, uh, rampant consumption and materialism of the most um, wealthy people in South Korea. So it plays into the sentiments that allowed Occupy to spread, which is our feelings about extreme inequality. And so we can look to something like Gangnam Style, which on the surface seems really silly and frivolous. And we can see that people do Gangnam Style because you know what? It's fun to dance. It's fun to be silly. It's a really catchy jig. And also, it's poking fun at the elites that are putting all of us on a crash course with oblivion, and we kind of don't like to be like them. So that already tells us that when we're cultivating our language and our cultural symbology, we're not starting from nothing. We go out into the culture and we find what's already there, and we use the language that's already there, and then we're going, then we're rocking. Uh, I just add another example of that. Uh, if any of you have seen the movie No, uh, which was playing at SIF a little a couple of weeks ago in Seattle, um, it's it's the story of uh, in Chile of um, voting out Allende, and the same idea that you were just talking about, a uh, whole ad campaign around what seems silly and frivolous and funny, and the, whole, the, the, the movie's fascinating because the conversations go back and forth between um, the, the sort of, what would I say, status quo PR people saying, oh, this will never work, and Allende's people all saying, we don't need to worry about this, this isn't gonna go anywhere, and it did go somewhere. It was very, very powerful. So I, I think there's something there that we could learn from as well. Wonderful example, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the term uh, global warming, it doesn't motivate to action. It's who doesn't want to be warm. And climate change, people respond, and people's response is, well, change is inevitable. What's the big deal? So I've been using the CO2 crisis, the carbon dioxide crisis, to properly paint the picture we're in. Oh, behind you. <clears throat> it's an interesting topic. I, I like uh, thinking about memes and appreciate the studies that you've done. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the process. Um, also, just to throw in a couple of other classics, you know, you brought in the, the picture of the globe, but I think America the Beautiful 
give a hoot, don't pollute. You know, some of those took over in a big uh, countrywide consciousness way. But um, could you talk about how you're crowdsourcing the messaging that you're looking at? It sounds like Twitter, but what, what else are you looking at? Well, the, the research methodology has a, a lot of pieces to it. For the study that we did, we uh, mined Twitter using keyword searches. And then we removed all tweets that were uh, either never retweeted, as if they were retweeted, someone replicated the behavior, and um, any that were not a, a creative original thought. It's like 90% of them were article titles that someone was retweeting. Um, and, but we also did a really fun process, a meme hackathon. Chris was there representing. Um, and basically, we got people telling stories and capturing stories that they would tell to someone else. So like uh, Anna talking about her daughter and her grandfather, isn't that a story you would tell to someone else? So as someone would tell one of the stories, we'd have them capture them. And we captured several hundred memes that way. So basically, we have many different ways that we get the memes. And, um, and I'd be happy to go into the details of that with, with people when there's more time. Um, but the point that I'll close with, because I think we're, we're getting right at time now, is that our ability to see this problem and be so freaked out by it comes from something that's incredibly comforting if we let ourselves see it. That thing is that we know more now than ever in human history. We are connected better now than ever in human history. And we have a stronger potential to connect with our home planet than ever in human history. And so if I can do meme research built on insights from cognitive science, psychology, neuroscience, anthropology, evolutionary biology, uh, earth system science, climate science, paleontology, dot, 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 et cetera, et cetera, that means that a whole bunch of humans have come before me, learned a whole bunch of stuff. By the way, all of those are memes. And they move through me to have significant, meaningful action in the moment. So if I, in the 36 years so far of my life, can accumulate this much knowledge, think about the other 7 billion people on this planet, how much we know. And so our ability to tap into what's already there in culture is immense. And I want to leave you with the great feeling of possibility if we utilize even a sliver of that. Thank you. <laughs>